the gospel of St. Luke. Chapter number 18, verse 9 through 14. That's where we're going to level up this morning. Yes. That's going to be our leveling place. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. When you have it, say amen. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. That's who he's talking to. People who trust in themselves. That they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Some people build their whole ministry around talking about other people. I thank you that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So every one that exalteth himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I thought about it and I decided to call it the leveling place. Because when I started reading the text, Brother Tudman, it seemed crooked to me. And I don't know what it is about me, but I can't stand crooked stuff. A picture leaning gets on my nerves. I have to go over there and straighten it up. I can't, I can't even stand, if you put something on one side of the wall, you gotta put something on the other side of the wall, or it gets on my nerves, cause it gotta be level. If I bake a cake and it's not level, I, 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 I keep it at home. Cause I ain't gonna send you no crooked cake. And it seems that this text starts out crooked between the Pharisee and the publican, but it ends up leveled because the exalted one is brought down and the humble one is exalted. And so I submit for your consideration, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that God's house is the leveling place. Spirit of the living God fall fresh on us now as we embark upon the mission of declaring your word. <laughs> You know how I love your word. I esteem it above my necessary food. 
I believe your word is strength to my bones. Your word has guided me past troubled waters. Your, God, your word has kept me from my own folly. Your word has strengthened me when I was tired. It has protected me when I was attacked. It has been a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Speak! <laughs> Great God that you are. I thank you in advance for what you're about to do. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. It is with reflection that I approached this text having many, many years ago had the privilege of traveling to the Holy Land. I know many of you have been there many times, but it was my first time going. I was in awe of the same. First time I went to the continent of Africa was the same year that I went to Jerusalem, both my natural heritage and my spiritual heritage were experienced in the same year. And I won't bore you with all the pictures from my vacation yet. But what was astounding was how Jerusalem is still such a significant city. It is the epicenter of spirituality for not just Christians, but more importantly, Jews. And oddly enough, at the time that I was there, and I believe still now, the Holy Mount is controlled by Muslims. And then that's, isn't that strange that the temple is controlled by Muslims and we had to take off our shoes to go in. You remember that? And there inside of the Holy Mount, they showed us what they believed to be the rock where Abraham offered up Isaac is in the center of the temple. It's not exactly the temple in our text today, but it is rebuilt in commemoration to the temple that is in our text. The temple is very important. From the Mount of Olives, you can see the temple, and I sat on the Mount of Olives and imagined him coming through the Western Gate. riding on a horse in glory. I can tell that I'm not talking to a, a well-seasoned church because you would know that he's coming back again. You would know that he's going to split the eastern sky one day, as old folks used to say. But this is not, this is not, the Jesus coming back is not the Jesus in the text. The Jesus coming back is the roaring lion of the tribe of Judah. The Jesus in the text is the Lamb of God about to be offered up. And he comes to us in this text teaching spiritual things in simplistic ways that we might be able to grasp the profundity of the text through parables. He has just finished a parable about prayer and the unjust judge and how important it is to pray. And I believe that the real power of prayer is not just being able to communicate with God, but in the process of prayer, the added benefit to talking to God is that you actually see yourself. I'm amazed at the people that do not know themselves. They know their representative. <laughs> you understood me. 
but they don't know themselves. And so it's difficult to bond with people who do not know themselves because you can't give yourself if you don't know yourself. You can't value yourself if you don't know yourself. You don't know what you need if you don't know yourself. You aren't even sure what you want if you don't know yourself. You don't know what you bring to the table if you don't know yourself. It's difficult for God to use you if you don't know yourself, if you don't know your strengths, your weaknesses, your tendencies, your liabilities. You don't know yourself. We're so busy trying to get to know other people people that we don't <laughs> know ourselves. I'm, I'm going to deal with this a little bit. Can I deal with this a little bit today? And so, so Jesus has come to the temple and I want you to understand that he is laboring in the temple with parables and I, I got distracted from the parable by the love that is represented with his continual coming back to a place where he is rejected trying to get them to see what they refuse to see. Uh, there, there's almost, an, it's almost a love affair with pain every time he goes to the temple. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the temple, the two and the truth. Three things and I'll be gone. The, the temple, the two, being the Pharisee and the publican, and the truth, the truth, the truth. He comes to the temple as the glory of the latter house. He is the fulfillment of prophecy. He is the promise that God gave to Zerubbabel's temple that the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the glory of the former house. He comes to the temple as that glory. How do you get that? Because the Bible says we beheld the wonder of its glory, the only begotten of its father, full of grace and truth. He comes to bring the glory back to a temple that has lost its glory. He is the embodiment of the missing Ark of the Covenant of the latter house. You see, they had been worshiping for years before a veil that had no Ark of Covenant, no glory. Isn't it amazing how long people can worship where God used to be? And fight you for where God used to be. And perform ceremonies and rituals and nobody seems to notice that God is gone. Ichabod, the glory is departed and yet the ceremonies continue and the glory is gone. His continued trips remind us of how long God strives with those he loves. He cannot be the stone that the builders rejected if he doesn't keep coming. It is his perpetual coming and pleading and telling different stories, trying to compel them to see who he is that makes him the stone that the builders rejected. You don't earn the right to say you're rejected when I say no once. You haven't put enough effort in it to determine whether you reject it or not until you have put everything you got in it and got nothing back. You got no right to say you reject it because I haven't even got to see you at your fullest. Jesus has to make sure that he has exhausted every possible way to get them to see who he is. It is only then that he can walk away fully and say, it is finished. It is only then that John can write, he came unto his own and his own received him not. It's only after he has strived with you and strived with you and talked to you and counseled you and whispered you and given you mercy and chance after chance after chance that he walks away. God is not placid, he is not, he is not 
contemporary. He is not casual. He is focused and when he goes after something, he will spend whatever it takes to bring it in. Some of you are not here because God is cheap. You're here because God is full of grace and he gave you a lot of grace and he extended a lot of mercy and he gave you a lot of opportunity. Somebody ought to shout me down right now. Eventually we'll see Jesus sitting on the Mount of, uh, of Olives crying out to God. The Bible says in Matthew 28, 36, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen would her chicks under her wings, but you would not. The scariest thing about God is when God gives up. As long as he's convicting you and wrestling with you and talking to you and chastening you and chastising you and admonishing you, at least he's not through with you. What bothers me is when I can do anything and nothing bothers me, it might be a sign that God has given Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you as a hen does her chicks, but ye would not. He says that only after he has exhausted every possible method to reach them. He's, let me talk about the temple. So much of Jesus' life centers around the temple. He'd been carried there as early as eight days old, and there he was circumcised. The very first drop of blood recorded happens inside the temple. And the last drop of blood happens outside the temple. He gave his first blood to it. He withheld his last drop from it. Oh God, don't withhold your blood from me. Don't let my stubborn ways bring you to a point that you stop dropping your blood down on me. The first drop fell in it, the last drop fell from it. It is an indication that he has given up on it. The temple is everything to him. The, 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 the temple was more than a sanctuary. It was a sacred source of an identity that had been besieged and, and altered as Jerusalem had become an outpost of Rome. The temple you see for the Jew is the place where they're holding on to the fragments of what they have left of their culture and the, their identity. Even though the temple was weak and convoluted by the influences of Herod and others, it was still a reminder of who they used to be. Sometimes you got to fight for what you got left. Rather than to just grieve over what is gone, you gotta fight for what you got left. Cause if the enemy gets you grieving over what's gone, he'll steal what you got left. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. That's a big deal right there. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. I can't tell you how many people I have seen hell bent on getting back what they lost and fooled around and, lo and lost what they had left because they didn't value the fragments. The fragments of their faith is embodied in this moment. And it is precious to them because they are captive in their own land, controlled by a monarchy. There are constant reminders that attest to the fact that they are free but not really. Have you ever been free but not really? That's what I think the Bible means when he said, he whom the Son have set free is free in 
indeed. Because it is possible to be free, but not really. And whatever little bit of freedom you have left, you're holding on to it to remind yourself so that you can be centered because you can't level if you can't find your center. <laughs> The first step to leveling out is finding your center. And some of you right now are trying to level yourself with your extremes. And you can't level yourself with your extremes. You can only level yourself with your center. I'll go deeper than that. This country's in trouble because we've lost our middle. Anytime you lose your middle, you're always going to be lopsided because you're trying to balance yourself by extremes. Extreme left is crazy. Extreme right is crazy. You got to find your middle before you can balance anything. It's true about the nation. It's true about you. So the devil is not after your extremes. He's after your balance. The Bible says, let your moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand, not going to either extremes. Don't be too deep, baby, because you're going to fall off trying to trip yourself and be so extra holy. And don't be so carnal that you got some kind of fictitious name that this grace is what you stand for. You got to be balanced. You got to be balanced. I'm scared of folk that's too deep. Deep folk make me nervous. Deep folk make me itch. Deep folk make me scared. You can't laugh. You can't joke. You can't have fun. You just so holy. You scare me. On the other hand, I can't stand folk that's so carnal. That a car could be sliding on ice and you can't even get a prayer through because you're so far away from God. I like to be <laughs> balance my point is this Jerusalem is captive in their own land unlike the Babylonian captivity where they are snatched away from their own land and as they are snatched away wounded and bleeding and battered and tattered and torn and Jerusalem is, is on fire they said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if I forget thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. And they found themselves in a strange land. And they asked them to sing a song. And they said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? See, that's what the enemy wants to do is get you in strange lands. So he, he can mock you because your anointing won't work when you've gotten too far in a strange land. So they hung their harps by the willow trees and they wept when they remembered Jerusalem. It's one thing to be captive out of your country. It's another thing to be a slave in your own house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it, it's one thing to have to go to work in hell, and it's another thing to get off work and come home to hell. You don't have to talk to me. I'll preach by myself. I can deal with crazy folk at church. I just don't want to roll over and bump into nobody crazy. No, 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 I gotta have some peace somewhere. Everybody can't be neurotic and unstable and out of their head. I've got to have some place to lay my head down. It's one thing to be captive in Babylon. It's another thing to be captive in Jerusalem. They're back home, but home is not home. There is no king in Israel. The succession has dissipated. Instead, a Roman monarchy has taken control and little remained of what was. Make me want to say, make it like it was. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. 
What did remain was a convoluted representation of both culture and oppression. It was Herod's temple, a painful reminder, and a pleasant memoir all at the same time. I want to talk to some people who have had bitter, sweet experiences where you can't really articulate how you feel about it because on one hand it's sweet and on the other hand it's bitter. Certain pictures you look at them and you look at them with fondness and they bring tears. Certain people when you think about them you miss them and... <laughs> Come on, talk to me real people. Talk to me real people. Talk to me real people. You see, Jerusalem had become a, a very different place. It was inhabited by Jews and Romans. It was very cosmopolitan at this time. It was a city filled with diverse people, including Africans and Greeks and Gnostics and Samaritans and many others converged upon the same city. It was the epicenter of culture and trade and commerce and all of that. That's why they were trying to kill Jesus when he was a baby because they heard he was king of the Jews and that meant that Herod might lose control of the epicenter of trade and commerce which is why the wise men brought gold and silver and when Herod heard about it he was tripping out because normally he would have gotten y'all don't want to hear me talk Shh, can't you hear the marching of the Roman soldiers on the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem riding on their horses and their chariots compelling the Jews to always remember that they are still in control coupled by the side roads littered with crucified criminals a constant reminder that they were not truly free in their own land. The presence of the temple still provides some semblance of identity. Sometimes you gotta hold on to whatever you got left. If it's a hairdo. Sometimes you wear your hair in defiance. Yes, snappy, curly hair, but it's mine. Sometimes you do certain things just to remind yourself you ain't taking everything now. I'll conform to a degree, but I'm going to fight back a little bit. You're not going to take everything until I lose my sense of self. Just to be in your circle, that's too much for me to pay. To lose me so you like me is too much. The temple is holding on to their culture. It still provides their identity so important to a culture filled with uncertainty and longing for solutions. Sounds a lot like us. Dissension, however, existed amongst the devout. Hence, verse 9 lets us know that Jesus is telling this story, this parable, to the backdrop of peril and mayhem. He is addressing people who think they are better than their own people. You got to know why the story, if you're going to tell the story. The story is built around arrogance and supremacy and people with their nose in the air thinking they're better than other people. The story is to level up between these two extremes. There are people who call themselves Christians even, who will look down their nose at you and act like you stink because you don't sit like them or walk like them or dress like them or clap like them or sing like them or look like them or vote like them. They'll turn up their nose and judge you in a minute. Oh, y'all ain't gonna talk to me. 
See, it would be nice to think that if you got together with the same beliefs, you would have the same status. But sometimes your greatest wounds come from people that are closest to you. Talk to me, somebody. It would be nice to think that if we grew up in the same house, I wouldn't have to watch my back with you. It would be nice to think. that I wasn't forced to sleep with the enemy. It would be nice to think that at least amongst the Jews there was agreement, but there was not. There was dissension, which takes me from the temple to the two. Because the two are an example of an extreme imbalance. On one hand, you have the publican at the temple. The publican is very unpopular because they were tax collectors. He expects to be reprimanded. He expects not to be lacked. He comes to the temple with humility because he has been hated to the point that he does not expect to be loved. He is a tax collector and he is working for Rome and he's a Jew. And of all people, they hated publicans. Publicans were Uncle Tom's. Publicans, I know, I'm going to keep on till you get it. I'm going to bring it where you can feel it. I'm going to bring it right home to you where your publicans were sellouts. Publicans were a house. Excuse me to all my white members. I had to talk in code for a minute. That's it. That, we'll tell you about that later, but we... we. <laughs> I had to slip into another language for a minute to make sure that you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. That, that, that they had the kind of anger that you have when somebody calls you a sellout because they were working for the Romans and worshiping with the Jews. And once you have, have a history of being hated, you don't expect to be loved. You can get so used to being rejected that you stop offering. You stop asking. You stop smiling, you stop engaging, you stop connecting with people because you already know how this story gonna go. I'm not dating nobody, I'm not talking to nobody, I don't need nobody, I don't want nobody, I can make it by myself. It's just code for I have been rejected, I have been hurt, I have been alienated, and I'm tired of the pain. So before I put myself in a vulnerable situation, I don't need you no way. I don't like you no way. That's your pain talking. Oh yeah, keep on sitting there acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. Your pain will make you assume the position before the command was ever made. So the publican, it's easy for him to humble himself because he's used to being hated and he smokes his breast in the presence of Jesus and says, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. It was easy for him to find himself because nothing will make you find yourself like people hating you. People hating you will drive you back inside of yourself, make you become your own best friend. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. People hating you and rejecting you will make you become acquainted with who you really are. Even if you don't tell nobody who you really are, if you are hated enough, you become acquainted with yourself when you have to take yourself out to dinner. 
when you have to buy yourself something for Valentine's Day, when you have to plan your holiday because you know ain't nobody else going to be thinking about you, you get to know yourself. You'll be shocked at the people who know calculus and don't know themselves, who know geometry and do not know themselves, who know politics and do not know themselves, who know scriptures and do not know themselves, who can sing but do not know themselves, who can preach but do not know themselves, who are fine as wine and do not know themselves. The one thing the publican had going he knew himself. So he, he says, Jesus, you don't have to discover me. You don't have to expose me. He says, I am a sinner. <laughs> have mercy on me. I am a sinner. You don't hear many testimonies like that in church. Have mercy on me, Lord. I'm a sinner. Used to be, we'd say, I'm a wretch, I'm done. But now we're important, important wretches. Dignified wretches, educated wretches, witch wretches. but you're still a wretch. See, that's the power of the text, is that the Pharisee thinks he's better, but he's not. He sees himself as superior, more moral, not corrupted. The doctrine of human depravity exposes the fact that there is a different story. Human depravity simply declares the fact that all of us fell in Adam. We fell into sin, the state of sin, not the act of sin. So while you might not have done the same act I did, you still fell into the same state I'm in. Yeah, 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 yeah. I ate banana pudding and you ate chocolate cake, but we both got fat. And you say, how could you eat banana pudding? That's nasty. Yeah, how about that chocolate you chewing on? We always push nasty away from what we lack. Oh, ain't nobody gonna shout today because I'm walking kind of heavy today. You can't handle it today. Yeah, whatever is nasty, freaky, or wrong is whatever you don't like. So you get to be better than somebody, which is important to you to build up your self-confidence. You get to say, at least I'm not like that. That's what's going on in this text. So the, the publican says, I am a sinner. The Pharisee starts talking about what he does. I pay my tithes. I fast twice a week. I am a Pharisee. He gives a job description, not an identity. The publican says, I am. The Pharisee says, I do. People who need to tell you what they do are trying to hide. Y'all ain't gonna help me today. Let me go preach somewhere else. Ain't you sick and tired of people that you walk up to and just meet them and they tell them, you know I want a Grammy. You know I, I'm, 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 I'm Luther Vandross' cousin on his mama's side, his auntie and my grandmama were sisters and cousins on the third, fourth, and said, shut up! I just said hello! I didn't ask you, are you driving a Mercedes? I didn't ask you for your net worth. I didn't ask you, do you speak in tongues? I didn't ask you how many dates you had on your calendar. Who are you? You see, the Pharisee is dressed up in camouflage. 
Camouflage is what we wear to hide who we are. Camouflage. Camouflage is what God gave certain animals because they didn't have teeth or they couldn't run fast or they couldn't growl. He gave them camouflage as a defense so that they could adapt to the color of the tree and thereby become invisible. So maybe if I wear enough jewelry, you won't see me. Maybe if I got enough degrees, you won't see me. Maybe if I razzle dazzle you with my talent, you won't see who I am. So ask me what I do, but don't ask me who I am. Cause the truth of the matter is, I don't even know who I am. I'm trying to hide who I am behind what I do. And that is the problem with the Pharisee because nothing in the description tells me who he is. Everything is about what he does and whenever people need to tell you what they do they either don't know who they are or they don't want you to know can I go deeper there is a difference between what you do and who you are the fact that you can sing don't mean you can handle money the fact that you can play the bass doesn't mean you ain't a liar. <laughs> the fact that you are fine and cute and good looking don't mean that you're gonna treat me nice. Because one of them deals with how much time you spend in the gym, but it don't have nothing to do with how much time you can spend with me. You can, your advertisement is good, but your product is bad. Come on with me. I dare you to jump on me. I will knock you out this morning. You've been living with the Pharisees and praying like the publican. Aren't you tired of hugging camouflage? Aren't you tired of doing business with people wearing camouflage? And you think you got one thing and you got something else. And you think you got this and you really got that. The Pharisee is a master of camouflage. In the Bible, when God calls you a hypocrite, it doesn't mean what it means today. In the Bible, a hypocrite was an actor. And actors said their lines behind a mask. And the word hypocrite just means you're talking behind a mask. I put on a face, but this ain't who I am. My face is smiling, but I don't like you. When you tell me how God bless you, I put on a face like I'm happy for you, but I really can't stand you. Yeah, 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 yeah. When, when I wear a mask, some of y'all are sleeping with a mask. Some of y'all are married to a mask. Some of y'all are working with a mask. The Pharisees' real problem is not the wretchedness of their sin. It is the audacity of their mask. The publican just comes clean, I'm a sinner. The Pharisees start talking about all this stuff Jesus said, ask him. I fast twice a week, I pay my tithes, I go to the temple daily. See, we go to church with both Pharisees and publicans. That's why it's hard to have worship because people who wear a mask can't worship. Yeah, 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 yeah. They can praise a little bit, but they can't worship because in order to worship, you gotta be real. You gotta be vulnerable. You gotta come clean. You gotta open up. You gotta be yourself. And you don't mind clapping a little bit, but the reason you can't really get down with worship service is because you're phony. Worship will make you drop your disguise. Worship will make you mess up your makeup. 
Worship will make you fall down on your face. Worship will bring you down to your knees. Worship will make you say yes to God. Worship will make you open up your heart and say I'm broken and I'm lonely and I'm hurting and I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. He can find a praiser anywhere. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. But when it comes to a worshiper, he has to seek for them. Because in order to worship, you got to be real. No, no, no. You don't have to be righteous. You don't have to be perfect. <laughs> You don't have to be talented. See, that's what's wrong with our worship services. Our worship services are driven by talent. I am tired of talent. It ain't about how many riffs you can make. It's about how you can fall on your face and lay out before God and say, Lord, I surrender. Don't confuse camouflage with reality. Let the worshipers make some noise in this place. Come on. Real worship. Real worship. Worship will make you strip. Worship will make you come clean. Worship will make you sell out. Worship don't care how much you paid for your dress. Worship don't care about how cute your hair is. Worship will make you reach down in your belly and say, oh God. Come on, come on, come on, strip. Take off that phony stuff. Take on all that stuff you're proud of and get in the presence of God and say, I'm a wretch and I need you right now. Open your mouth and holler to God. Yeah, yeah. Nudge somebody, tell them I dare you to level up. I dare you to level up. I dare you to come out of your camouflage. I dare you to come out of all your isms and schisms. I dare you to really worship God like you need a touch from him. Like you can't face tomorrow without him. Like you need him more than you need your breath. Is there anybody left in the church that knows how to worship God in spirit? Here's my third point. And in truth, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. God wants somebody to worship him. In truth, to worship him lonely, to worship him tired, to worship him confused, whatever your truth is, that's what God wants. He wants you to open up your heart and not give him your titles, but give him your truth. I don't know what to do without you. I can't live without you. I can't walk without you. I can't move without you. I can't stand without you. Come on, open your mouth. Open your mouth. Rebuke the devil. You Pharisee, come on and open your spirit and talk to your gut.
See, we got too many people that are believing alternative facts. <laughs> alternative facts. They're not facts. They're the truth we tell ourselves. It's the camouflage we wear. It's our alternative reality. We live in a false dimension which causes you to be arrogant so you can look down your nose at somebody else. But if we ever got down to the truth, there is no difference between the Pharisee and the publican. They're both wretches. They both need God. If we ever get down to the truth, we won't need dancers, instruments, worship leaders, praise singers, tambourines, bongos, drum sets, and organs because truth will drag you down to the altar. Truth will strip you at the feet of Jesus. Truth will make you cry out to God. Is there any true worshipers in the house today? Somebody shout, I need more grace. I need more grace. If I'm gonna work this job, I need more grace. If I'm gonna stay in this marriage, I need more grace. If I'm gonna raise these kids, I need more grace. If I'm gonna deal with my pain, if I'm gonna deal with my problems, if I'm going to stand the times, if I'm not going to lose my mind, you see the Pharisees needed it. The publicans needed it. The drug dealer needs it. The deacon needs it. The church member needs it. The club owner needs it. The alcoholic needs it. The altruistic need it. All we need from Jesus is a little more grace. Grace is the leveling place. So God says to the one that's up, I'm going to bring you down. And the one that's down, he said, I'm going to raise you up because I got to level this thing out because you can't worship without balance. And so you fake the worship. You have a form of godliness denying the power thereof. Because if real worship hit this place, cancer would have to run out of here. Tumors would have to leap out the building. If real worship hit this place right now, Alzheimer's would have to get out of here. If real worship hit this place, all swelling would come out of your joints. Somebody lift your hands and worship till you feel the power of God. I'm scared. Truth is, I'm tired. Truth is, I'm lonely. Truth is, I'm worried. Truth is, I'm frustrated. Truth is, I need more help. Truth is, I'm weary. Truth is, I need a fresh touch from God. Is there anybody here that's ready to keep it 100? This is... This is the leveling place. Arrogant people, stay on up there. Be important in your cute camouflage. Desperate people, Fall out on this altar like you lost your mind. Fall out on this altar like you don't care what you got on. 
Fall out on this altar like if you don't get help from God, you're going to lose your mind. Fall out on this altar like you don't care what nobody thinks. Fall out on this altar like you are tired a camouflage in your pain and your situation and your circumstances fall out on this altar. Like you don't care if your makeup messes up. Fall out on this altar like you want a touch from God. Fall out on this altar like you need him more than you need your next breath. Fall out on this altar like you need a touch from God and you didn't come to show off nothing except your desperation to get more grace from God. Fall out on this altar like you came to do business in the heavenlies. Fall out on this altar like you're ready to open up for God. This is a leveling place. This is a leveling place. I'm a sinner. I'm a wretch. I'm worried. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I'm empty. But I am what I am. And here I come into your presence. Here I come into your presence. Here I come into your presence. It's me, Lord. It's me. It's not my representative. It's not my fake face. It's not my camouflage. It's not my car. It's not my house. It's not my degrees. It's me, Lord. This is a troubling stage in my life. This is an empty stage in my life. This is a frustrating stage in my life. And I need a touch from God. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times would I have picked you up like a hen does her chicks? But ye would not. Ye would not. Ye would not, ye would not. It's not that I won't bless you, it's that you won't come clean. It's not that I won't help you, it's that you won't cry out. I'm not talking about telling your business on Twitter. I'm not talking about telling your business on Facebook. But God said, when you come to me, you keep trying to tell me what you got. And I wanna know who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Jesus, Jesus. The publican got in. The Pharisee was locked out. There is grace for the Pharisee though. Because God said, I'm going to bring you all the way down. If you don't come down on your own, I'm going to bring you to a basement. I'm going to bring you to a level place. I'll bring you to your knees if I have to do it in a wheelchair. I'll bring you to your knees if I have to do it in a nursing home. I'll bring you to your knees if I have to do it in, in intensive care. One way or the other, I'm going to level you up. Either you come on your own or I'm coming to get you. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.